We shouldn't wake up in the morning and just throw out all of our values. We need to maintain our values, celebrate our values, grow from our values. And uh, I, I do care about that very much. Can you tell me about your early days at Pepper Diet and what brought you here? The year was 1983 and uh, my wife and I had one child at that time. I worked at another um, college in Oklahoma and then I had secured a law degree, passed the bar, done some law practice. I felt like at age 33 it was time to consider doing something different. And so I actually was going to go to work with a, a law firm in Dallas, Texas. And uh, was pretty excited about that. And then out of the blue, uh, David Davenport, who was later to become president of Pepperdine, called and asked if I wouldn't like to come and interview for some jobs in Malibu. And so I said, you know, David, I've never been to California. don't really want to go to California. He said, we'll fly you out. So my wife and I came out after Thanksgiving in 1983. They offered some very interesting positions. The one that I took was to represent the university in regulatory matters. We were trying to develop this campus, get permission for some things that we'd already done, and then um, make well some relations in, this, in the city of Malibu. At that time, it was not a city, it was just a community. So I was involved in community relations and securing permission for everything from the Thornton Administration Building to the tennis courts, to the Towers Dorm, to the Science Building, the Arts Building. Um, just a lot of projects. And they are good memories. At the time it was hard work, but they're good memories today. Was there a specific uh, aspect of the community that brought you here? The Pepperdine community. Uh, I was at the very beginning. I knew that it was a special community because it was definitely a community uh, predicated on faith, a lot of different faiths, which I liked. And then also, I saw faculty really determined to achieve excellence in the classroom, and that's not always true at a college or university. So, the both put together uh, were perfect, and uh, it was a very good experience for my wife and for myself. It was frightening. Um, I learned how to pray hard during those early days because I didn't know what I was doing a lot of the time. I just kind of made it up as I went along, but it turned out okay. Um, why exactly did you want to be a part of the community? Well, it was a time for change, and Pepperdine offered something that Dallas didn't. And Dallas is going to be a purely law practice, and I know how law practices come and go, and I wasn't so sure how that particular economy was going to work out. And then along comes Pepperdine, and they offer me a, a legal challenge, um, a spiritual opportunity in a very different place. And so uh, I thought I would come out here with my wife and our, as I say, our, our daughter, and um, solve this little problem in two years and then go back to America. So that's how I used to say it. It took me 15 years to solve that little problem, as I describe it, that included the development of the Drescher Graduate Campus. And um, by that time, you know, we'd fallen in love and I'd been given greater and greater responsibility. And I had, when I was executive vice president for nine years, I thought I had the best job at Pepperdine. And then I became president and I think that's the best job at Pepperdine. <laughs> Well, um, I'm a little uh, on the shy side, that would surprise people, but I am. And so to come to a brand new place where a lot of people were looking you over, deciding whether or not they thought you could make it or not, you know, can someone from Kansas and Oklahoma make it in, in California? So that became a bit of a challenge for both Debbie and for me. You know, did we have the sophistication and the skill set to make it? And uh, so I kind of like that. I like being challenged. Uh, every day was new and different. Um, so it felt a little frightening at first, but then we settled in, developed some really good friends, and you know some of the best friends I will ever have in life I made here in California. Um, what were the most pressing issues facing the university? Well, this is a little bit indelicate, but um, wastewater treatment was huge. When I arrived in 1984, my first 
day on the job was February the 6th, 1984. And um, we didn't have enough wastewater treatment for the future of the university. And you can't go forward unless you have fresh water, wastewater treatment, and enough electricity and all those things. So I worked really, really hard on that. And Malibu still doesn't have an adequate solution in my view. But we worked very hard on our, our own wastewater treatment plant and developed a great relationship with a, with a nearby agency and we solved that problem. Um, so that was the initial pressing issue. Then just generally, uh, a college or university should have hopes and dreams and we had big hopes and dreams. And we, we needed for the regulatory agencies to not just say no, but to work with us on the how. And so I spent a lot of time working on um, okay, this is what we want to do, what are your concerns, and then solving the concerns of the, of the various regulatory agencies. I think I was dealing with about 33 different regulatory agencies. And uh, we developed a rhythm, and we became known as people, and this is not just me, this is my, my colleagues as well, we became known as people who told the truth. And when we said we would do something, we were known as people who followed through what we said we would do. And that reputation really helped us with California Coastal Commission, County of Los Angeles, even the Malibu community. And was there a specific sphere of the university that needed more support and guidance than the others? Well, um, I don't mean this to sound self-serving, but I think what it needed was a, a greater sense of sophistication in how we approached regulatory uh, work and so we put together a dream team. I mean, It was really a wonderful group of men and women, lawyers, planners, traffic engineers, architects, engineers, uh, environmental consultants. I mean there I, I think back very fondly on about 15 people who really cared about Pepperdine. We weren't just a client, we were a cause and I still stay in touch with a lot of them. And so I think developing a greater sense of sophistication that we needed to play as big as UCLA and as big as USC in actually a much more complex environment. So I think a lot was required of us and I think, I think we delivered. And I think our success in developing this campus and getting, gaining approvals that should last us for the next 20 or 25 years. I, th I think it, we demonstrated that we did the right thing at the right time. Um, and what were some of your goals when you began your time at Pepperdine as president? I, um, I really wanted to see the university's scholarship develop. I wanted us to hire more uh, and uh, equally talented faculty. Uh, I was very interested in diversity. We were not very diverse at that time. I don't know what, how many students of what percentage, but I would say it was about uh, 18 to 20 percent students of color today were, were a majority students of color. I wanted us to, to stay in touch with our heritage. Uh, who, who was Pepperdine at its founding? What did Mr. Pepperdine have in mind? I wanted to honor that. And we do uh, for Founders Day, for example. I wanted us to develop our, our resources. And at that time, I remember in my inaugural address talking about my desire that Pepperdine would have a billion dollar endowment and saying humorously, I could hardly say that, a billion dollar endowment, it seems so far out there, but today we do have a billion dollar endowment. And then really important to me and sort of surprising in a fifth point in my inaugural address was I wanted to develop the community uh, that is Pepperdine. And a part of that um, would be our relationship with students. And we didn't want just a transitory relationship with students. We wanted a lifelong relationship with students because if you do that, then the chances are they're going to be very productive alumni for you. And so I wanted, and I wasn't sure how all that was going to come together, but I wanted to find ways to knit together faculty and staff and administration with students at the heart of everything that we were and would be. So. Those were the five points and I've stuck with them. I, there's hardly a day that I don't pray about some aspect of that. And have we accomplished everything? No. Have we made progress in all five areas? Yes. As you look back on your time at Pepperdine, what are the projects or accomplishments you're most proud of to be a part of? And what has been your proudest moment at Pepperdine? 
Well, I, I mean, I'd have to say my single proudest moment was when I was named president on December 7, 1999. And I still remember the, the first student who greeted me after that announcement. Her name was Katie Bauckham, um, part of the Hahn family. And uh, uh, there's a picture of us out in front of some others. She's giving me a, a big hug. And I don't think... I don't think I knew all that was ahead of me. Uh, even at age 47, I think I was. But I knew that it was going to be important, it was going to be a great opportunity to serve, and it was probably going to be the best job of my life. So being named president on that day was huge. Being inaugurated was something I will never forget. Um, the day that we won all of our, the final legal battles and all of the approvals to build the Drescher Graduate Campus, which many thought could not be done. Some of the best lawyers in Los Angeles said, you can't do that, you'll never be able to do that. But we did it. That was a pretty proud moment. Um, handing my daughter her undergraduate diploma and later a law degree, those are very proud moments for me. And I would, I would say, I'll just, I'll end with the fact that my wife and I have now been married 44 years. and. Uh, for presidencies, presidencies sometimes are hard on couples, but I can say that our marriage is stronger today than it was when we started now 18 years ago, and so I'm pretty proud of that too. Um, but also going off of that, what are things that you think could have been handled better, or what has been your most difficult moment or decision after? Oh, there's so many. I, I second guess, guess myself all the time. I can remember some times, I think my worst decisions have been when I didn't trust my instincts. And there have been some, there were some faculty issues where I, in retrospect, if I just followed my initial instinct, I would have been much better off. I think um, because I am conservative, and not in a political sense, but just kind of conservative in my approach to life. I think I was slow, slow to respond to social issues. Um, I think I found a good place on LGBTQ+, for example. Um, that was not something that anybody trained me for or equipped me. It was something that I had to figure out for myself. How do I honor Pepperdine's heritage while preparing the university for the future and while loving all students? That was, um, that was a very uh, important time, I think. Um, I can think of so many ways that I could have been a better president, but there's nothing I can do about that. All I can say is that I, I pedaled as fast as I possibly could. And, uh, you know, my prayer since I made the decision that I was going to step down and make the announcement that I would step down in March of this year was that I would, that I would finish well and I would finish strong. And uh, so I I'm committed to continuing to pedal as fast as I can all the way through the finish line tape on July 31 of 2019. And that today is very important to me. Not, I don't want to focus on what's next. I don't want to focus on what could have been. I want to focus on you know what we've done and what we're going to do in this final year. Um, going back to what you were saying about uh, adapting but holding on to values, what has that been like as the world's progressed and as social movements have come and gone, holding on to Pepperdine's legacy as that's gone on? Well, I'm not too impressed with the world. <laughs> I, I don't think it's um, oftentimes a very wise place and so I, I would rather hold to our values, um, being ever thoughtful about the need for awareness and change and with every generation of student that comes to us, they're different, they have different needs, different expectations, try to respond to those while remaining Pepperdine. Um, that, probably, that probably takes as much wisdom as any thing that I do. Yeah, it takes a lot of conversation with people I respect. Um, I do a lot of reading about your generation and the generations that have preceded you and, and will follow you. So if the question is what's it like, it's, it is difficult but very very important and the last thing that I want to do uh, is be thought of as an out of touch president as somebody who's not paying attention who's resting on his laurels and I'm, I'm not much of a laurel rester. 
Um, in 2012, there was a fairly public incident with your son on the campus. The community really rallied behind you and your wife. Can you talk about uh, what that support means to you now? Well, it was, um, it was a chance to be embraced or rejected. And we were embraced. And the, um, the thing that meant so much to me that I can barely speak about even now was the graphic. And the graphic did a, a, it was a editorial cartoon. Something to the effect, AKB has always had our back. Now we need to have his. I can't tell you what that meant. And it came at a, that whole incident um, is, you know, still very, very painful and raw. But uh, making it more awkward is the fact that right after it happened, uh, WAS, Western Association of Schools and Colleges, was coming here for an accreditation visit. Well, that incident should have had no you know, part of their inquiry, in my humble opinion. But it did, and I was able to point to the graphic and said, that's really what I want to say about that, that this community is going to let me work through that with dignity, and I am going to work through it with dignity. So, yeah, that, that, was, uh, that was hard. But it was very human, too. I, I don't know very many families that are perfect. And some um, imp imperfections are louder and noisier than others, but all families have struggles. And I think if there's a silver lining in that incident, um, it is that I really softened at that point. And when students would would find themselves in difficulty or when parents knew of their son or daughter being in difficulty. I was much more able to help and given some of the things that that our son went through I was reading voraciously and I was a virtual walking encyclopedia on um, things to do and places to go for assistance. So I, li I like to think that it's changed my life for the better and that I'm softer and much more approachable on that. How has being president of the university changed over the past two decades? And in what ways are your days different, but also your roles at the university? I don't know. Uh, I do think the job is one of greater complexity today. Um, so I think you have to respond to that. If, if, you, if you start out with the privilege of being a binary president, you know, yes or no, black or white, right or left, you're not going to last very long because it's much more complex than just binary decision making. I think the thing that is troubling for me today is, and, I, and I'm going to lay some of the blame at the feet of higher education, I don't think we explain ourselves and, why, and, and what we do and how we do it uh, as well as we should have. And so the public and the press have a narrow view of that. They don't understand why uh, every year there must be some price increase. Uh, the only way to not have a price increase is to start cutting programs, letting people go, and letting quality slip. That's just the truth. Yet we've never explained that adequately, in my view. And so there's a lot of, lot of critics uh, today, and a lot, of, a lot of the social issues that were mentioned earlier um, have come. Uh, to, the, to the Pepperdine campus, you've got to be able to respond to those. You've got to be very nimble, and um, not your first reaction probably is not going to be your best reaction in every case. But to listen before you speak, I think presidents that haven't learned that or can't learn that probably shouldn't be presidents. So I'm surprised at all of the um, criticism that higher education gets because I still think of it as as a very noble profession. I'm sorry that government, that accreditation, uh, sometimes even the Supreme Court do not favor faith-based institutions, even treat us neutrally, even-handedly. Um, that has certainly been a change, too. Um, almost everything we do gets challenged in one way or another. And as long as it makes us better, fine. But if it's criticism for the sake of criticism, I'm not very interested in that. So I don't know if I can do any better in responding to that question than that. Um, how have you seen yourself change in your time here? Um, I'm a much better budgeter of time. Uh, I 
I've learned how I work best, and so I, and that's basically at home at night. Uh, in my office in Thornton, uh, where I spend a lot of time, it's mostly phone calls, returning phone calls, meetings, preparing for meetings, reading materials for meetings, but to write speeches, significant correspondence, communicate with donors and politicians and, and friends, I do that in my home office. And uh, fortunately, I have a very nice home office, which I'll show you in a minute if you'd like to see it. And um, now the downside of that is that the days are very long. And if you had told me when I was um, your age that I would routinely work 75, 80 hours a week and love every minute of it, I would have scoffed. But the fact is that I do because everything seems meaningful and, and important. And uh, I'm already, I, what I was doing earlier this morning is I was making a list of things I want to accomplish this weekend. Um, not in my Thornton office, but here at, at the Brock House. So, um, so I, I happily work long hours. I know how I work best, and so I seek that. I've become pretty smart about that through the years. I think I use leverage better. I think I know whom to call, how to pitch messages, what sells, what does not sell. So I think I'm, I think I'm much wiser about how I put, try to put Pepper down in the best possible light. I've learned that over time. In what ways has the student body changed in your time here, or the faculty as well? Well, faculty. Um, I think we're putting much more emphasis on scholarship. We've always emphasized teaching, but now I think we do even a better job of that. We've kept class size small, very much against the odds. Um, we might be able to hold prices down better if we weren't so determined to keep classes small. Um, so I think, I think faculty have always prized teaching, but alongside that, we're prizing and supporting scholarship and support of good teaching, relevant teaching, current teaching. So I think we've emphasized that. That's a part of the scholarship, the, the, the fifth um, challenge that I mentioned earlier. Uh, I think we, we do a better job with that. I think students uh, have become um, very conscientious consumers of goods and services. And they're very, when I think about the cafeteria, when I think about the bookstore, when I think about uh, health and counseling, when I think about intramural and recreation, when I think about library, when I think about so many attributes of the university, we had to, and we did, up our game in response to a, an increasingly talented student body uh, but also a student body who, um, as I said, were very conscientious consumers. And uh, they asked for what uh, those things for which they uh, had need to have a great education. And do I think we spoil students? No, I do not. Do I think we enable students? I certainly do. And so through international programs, which are best of the breed, through investments in, in library, what we're going to do in the Student Recreation and Events Center, Eventually, what we've done at the law school recently, um, it's just we do it because we love the students and we want to be a good value when you come here. We want to make sure that you make lots of memories and that you feel engaged and, and appreciated. And I, I'd like to think that all that is coming together, together better today than it was 18 years ago. Are there some goals you have yet to accomplish? Oh, my goodness, yes. I, um, I won't be here for the next fundraising campaign, but I'm anxious to see this, the new Student Recreation Event Center fully funded. I actually hope to see it fully funded before I step down next July. Um, I think Pepperdine should have a Phi Beta Kappa chapter, and we are busily working on that, but that's something else that will be accomplished under the watch of the next president. Uh, I think as we do some expansion at Seaver College, I think we need to think about where our next international program goes. And if the present uh, international program offerings are the ones that we need. I, I'm proud that we cover Spanish and, 
and French and Italian and you know the, the lessons we can learn from the United Kingdom and and of course what we're and, and uh, Mandarin. I, I'm I'm proud of that, but I think there may be some other locations that we might explore. I wish we had uh, something in Mexico or Central America in a third world location. We most of our locations are very first world, and I think it'd be good st for students to live. Uh, in that environment. So those are some things that the next president will accomplish. Um, I'm trying to get some things in place so that there will be some really interesting work for the team for, for many years. And I won't be here, but I will maybe have had a hand in laying a foundation for it. Um, and where does Pepperdine have room to grow? Oh, academically, I, I think. Um, Right now we are a pretty predictable liberal arts school with a very strong business um, program. It's business and natural sciences and social sciences are our three largest majors, comprising about 65, 66% of academic programs. I think we could host a medical school and have had conversations with people through the years about that and I fully expect that to come back around again. So I think uh, I think we could host a medical school. I think we should host an engineering school at some point. Space would be an issue, but not academic quality and not standing in the community. It would be space and funding, but those things are, are solvable. If you have the will, those things are solvable. Um, and what qualities do you think the next president needs to lead Pepperdine to the next decade? And what's one piece of advice you would give them? Well, I, I think I would hope to speak with them about following their instincts and taking time to develop and hone their instincts. I think that uh, both our students and our faith mission are sacrosanct. I think uh, the next president really needs to care deeply about students and not view them as a means to the end, but indeed the end. Um, and then I think you, you, you've got to love our faith heritage, not just abide our faith heritage, but love our faith heritage for it to thrive. And so I'm hoping that they'll find someone who will do that and whether he or she will, will find that easy and, and, and meaningful for themselves and their family. So I, I will, I've got several things tucked away that I would like to share with them very confidentially. I, I have George Pepperdine's Bible that he took with him around the world that I want to personally give to them. I have some things that will be meaningful moments at the right time. But as I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm much more into you know, the metaphor of pedaling fast or running fast uh, from now through July 31 of 2019. And there'll, there'll be time enough for, for um, sentimentality. Uh, right now I'm, I'm wanting to do a good job for you for as long as I have the privilege of being president. And what's, so my last question before Mary Kate can take it away. Um, what, what's next for you after that, after that sprint July? Well, I'm exploring some things. I, I, um, we have our first grandchild, uh, Jackson Benton Thomas, and uh, he's an absolute delight. I, at one point when I first arrived at Pepperdine, I, I coached Little League for eight years and I still think I could teach him to throw a proper curveball at the right time. And so I'd like to be active in his life and who knows, he may have brothers and sisters, I don't know. I'm still licensed to practice law and I love the law, uh, exhibited mostly through teaching, which I'm doing this term. So I think wherever I go and whatever I do, I will try to be a teacher. Um, I'd like to become a really good Bible school teacher. I haven't had the time to do that for a number of years and then I, I do love to teach constitutional law so actually it's, it's I get that question a lot as you might imagine and I've decided not to really think much about that until Christmas when I have time to think about it so come see me after the first of the year and I'll have a better answer for you <laughs> <laughs>